Hey, Kurt Rappencheck with National Parks Traveler. We're down in Everglades National Park in Florida talking with Jonathan Taylor, the park's restoration program manager um, at the Hole in the Donut. Um, Jonathan, what is the Hole in the Donut? What are we looking at here? You are looking at a wetland mitigation bank and you are looking at a wetland restoration project that is underway. The, the project boundaries uh, encompass 6,500 acres. Uh, we have actually restored uh, 6,300 acres. The balance of the land that we haven't restored is comprised of these spoil mounds, which are byproducts of the restoration. This was uh, agricultural land, and I think you said it was uh, tomato fields? Mostly, yeah, uh -huh. that's what they were known for, growing uh, tomato crops. They would grow these during the dry season, which is roughly between January and May. Uh, and they were able to export these products up during the winter uh, from South Florida. And uh, apparently it was quite successful for many years, between 1915 roughly and 1970. Farming didn't stop until 1970, and the park was established in 1947. When farming ceased, uh, by 1975, all of the, the land that had been farmed had been acquired by the National Park Service. And slowly but surely, uh, resource managers uh, observed that a non-native plant called Brazilian pepper uh, started to colonize uh, the farmed land. What we ended up trying to remove and remove today is that Brazilian pepper. Eventually, uh, it just completely covered the whole farmed land. None of the traditional resource management techniques for restoration uh, were successful. And three things played a role in allowing the Brazilian pepper to be so competitive. Combination, some interaction of those three things, the nutrients, the, the plowing, and the decreased uh, uh, hydro period allowed for Brazilian pepper to be just particularly successful and outcompete uh, all of the native plants that w may have tried to colonize the site after farming ceased. They tried mowing, they tried, uh, uh, did I mention burning? They, yeah. they tried to, to do burning and none of those techniques prevented the Brazilian pepper from dominating the site. And it was only uh, somewhat by accident that they stumbled upon the technique that you see uh, behind you here uh, that we used since the inception of the project, which is uh, ultimately to remove all of the farm soil from the limestone bedrock and, and bring it up here. Uh, and they came up here mostly for uh, the, the horticulture trade. Uh, they were, originally these were planted in people's yards as, uh, as ornamental plants. Is all this going to be pushed back into place, so to speak? Oh no, so this is a spoil mound. All of that material is what created this spoil mound. We have to remove the soil down to bedrock down to limestone bedrock and this is where we store the material. So that's the restored area and these, these spoil mounds will stay here indefinitely. Still had some wildlife value as a, as a non-native forest, forest and wetlands. That more uh, woodland species would have taken advantage of, of the site. Perhaps bears would have, would have stayed in the, in the Brazilian pepper forest or a panther would have dinned in the Brazilian pepper forest. So it had, it didn't have no value. It didn't have its historic value. The oldest sites, even some of the intermediary sites, look remarkably like what was here historically. Dominated by sawgrass and, and muley grass, which were the two marsh species that I was, that dominated uh, the prairie or the marsh historically before farming occurred. And they provide the, they collect a fee for doing the restoration work that captures the work that you see going here, uh, monitoring, prescribed fire, uh, maintaining the site against new invasive species, for example, uh, and reporting and, and whatnot. And all of those costs into perpetuity are covered by the fee that people who need mitigation for their impacts, uh, they can pay into the program and that's what funds the activities that you, you see here. Yeah, so this, this plant behind me uh, that you see here, compound leaf, it gets maybe 15, 20 feet tall. 
uh, is is Brazilian pepper. Th this area, there's a high concentration of it. This is not in the project area, uh, but uh, it, it was brought in as a as a ornamental, um, uh, and it produces uh, wonderful red berries in in and around the Christmas season. One of the reasons that it's called Christmas Christmas holly. Um, but yeah, this is what dominated site. You can see how it's dominated site. There's very little growing in under, underneath the understory. Uh, very little biodiversity underneath this forest of Brazilian pepper. And that's exactly what this invasive species does. It dominates a site, takes over, and outcompetes uh, all, all of the native plant species. You'll find very little uh, native plant species up underneath this particular patch of Brazilian pepper. And that's what the hole in the donut was. It was just almost nearly one monotypic forest. Of this of this plant, this forest of Brazilian pepper that was that the, the hole in the donut was known for no longer exists. And like I said earlier, at the restoration site, that's the last installment of the of the dense Brazilian pepper uh, monoforest. The restored areas still can be colonized by Brazilian pepper, but because we removed some of those characteristics of the farm soil, and it allowed the native plant species to be equally, if not more, competitive than the Brazilian pepper. Jonathan, this is your oldest reclamation site, restoration site? It was restored in 1989. Uh, and I just wanted to show you what uh, uh, the oldest site looks like. This is what we aspire to for the rest of the site. And we have 30 years of data. All, all of our restored sites are trending towards this outcome. And this area continues to get closer and closer to what uh, the the natural the undisturbed natural areas look like so this is this is undoubtedly uh, a, a success yeah so what made this project so successful is that we could remove the soil like you saw at the the last restoration area uh, and then we sit back and let natural processes take over so all of these native plant species they come in on their own um, and uh, the hydrology is restored just as a natural function of us having removed that soil. Uh, we are able to have prescribed fire. So all of these things we can just uh, let happen uh, of their own accord and we don't have to, we don't have to jumpstart that any more than what we did just by removing the soil. The area that you saw where we were restoring, we were bringing that material over to the spoil mound and, and uh, this, is, this is the outcome of it after many years, yeah. So this spoil, all of the surrounding area that's restored that we were visiting just earlier. All that farm soil was was put in a spoil mound, mm -hmm. and we have eight of them. They're roughly 25 acres each in size, most of them. And uh, this is what they turn into. Each mound has a, a unique characteristic, but it's mostly dominated by native plant species. You can see butterflies, and we have lots of invertebrates. It's It's been an interesting uh, outcome that the uh, the mounds have some wildlife value.